My presentation today is about rediscovering imagination. It's based on exercises I developed uh, over the past 15 years of teaching. After I discovered that my former students who were very intelligent, smart juniors and seniors in college who'd had every biology class they needed, had no ability to imagine in their heads how cells worked. It terrified me at first, and I spent about a year going around the country trying to figure out what was happening. I thought perhaps it was our department or the college or whatever, and I found out in interviewing various teachers and <clears throat> a lot of AP high school science teachers that, in fact, this was uh, really a sort of universal problem. What happened is in the beginning, I could get the students into what really felt like a catatonic state in about 10 minutes by asking them to close their eyes and imagine things. After all the experience I had with this, I will have to say that it isn't a stretch to think that we could all benefit from focusing more on one of our great human gifts, imagination, and making it a bigger part of our lives and how we think of doing things. Today, I'll talk uh, about four parts. Uh, the first is an introduction to imagination, and then principles of rediscovering our imaginations, and then five exercises that we'll do uh, that will help you begin to see uh, how to practice imagination or how to, how to I, I see imagination as a muscle. And so this is really how to engage and, and activate and grow this muscle. And finally, a conclusion. Our world today is very complicated and especially with the pandemic, but normal is what we're used to, right? And there's a short term normal for people that can change depending on the window of time that you're thinking about. And there's a longer term evolutionary normal for humans. So sometimes when you're teaching or doing things or trying to make, do anything in society, uh, it can seem really difficult or you see non-random distributions and you can't understand it. Oftentimes when you run into those sorts of things, you have to look back at evolution and it's often something that we have stopped doing or things that we haven't stopped doing that were useful back when we were hunting or hunters and gatherers, but maybe aren't so useful right now. So when I look at these kinds of issues, when I first started seeing what the students were going through, I thought about what their education was like up to this point. And then after that, I began to think evolutionarily how we developed our thinking and how we developed our, our imaginations. And all that came together to help me um, find ways to, uh, to uh, disrupt what was going on and to get students to think more imaginatively. At first, it really scared them. And sometimes they even got mad. But after a while, when they figured out that they could do it, that they knew how to access their imaginations, they knew that it was fun and they were good at it, and that it was really valuable, they became ecstatic about being able to do this. So what's the value of imagination anyway? Well, Albert Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. And he developed the theory of relativity by imagining himself writing on a particle of light. Now you have to know physics, you have to have some facts, but he was able to develop an entire theory simply by imagining himself writing on this light and figuring out how fast it would go and what would happen to gravity under those conditions. And I, I can't imagine, it would just be such a, cool thing to be there while he was doing that. But there's people who have studied children zero to five who aren't allowed to pretend play. And interestingly, they lose analytical and symbolic reasoning and empathy because they can't imagine themselves being somebody else. But, but the analytical and symbolic part is really important. And that is that math requires imagination. Uh, language, the use of language in poetry and other kinds of writings really requires imagination. 
So imagination can also reduce fear and anxiety. There's some research on that. But basically what it is, is that if we can uh, trust that we have an imagination that will allow us to solve problems today, that we can trust ourselves to solve unexpected challenges that come our way in the future. So I honestly feel that imagination is a human superpower that can be relearned and developed uh, so that we become um, heroes in our own lives, able to do things that we uh, previously wouldn't have thought about doing. So what happened to our imaginations? Why don't we use them very often? I mean, when we were kids, we all played, we had active imaginations. I, mean, I used to play statues and hide and seek and all those kinds of things. And um, I think that what happened was that, uh, and I don't know at the exact time when this started, but it sometime around the time um, in the 90s, when we started talking more about No Child Left Behind, and we began to get uh, upset that our students weren't testing very well in math. And the only solution we could think of was to make them memorize more and work more and test them more. We want, it was almost punitive the way we were thinking about it. And I, I believe that most people didn't realize um, that it takes a lot of imagination to be a mathematician. And so by, by really uh, getting the students to just memorize things, we were actually reducing their capability at math. And we created a resonance of passive education because we weren't reading, uh, we weren't playing outdoors. There are a lot of uh, video games and those sorts of things. And we were, you know, have so much more input from our phones in it. Uh, and, and we weren't dreaming. It, it's so ironically to me, when I figured out what the issue was, it wasn't what we were doing. It was really the problem was what we weren't doing. We weren't taking time for ourselves to dream and to daydream and to imagine. So I have a link to my original essay from 2006 when I realized that um, rewarding for memorization and not for creativity was really hurting our students. And in fact, I think it hurts us and it hurts our teachers too. So our imagination is what we bring to the world. It's very difficult to work that muscle in the beginning. It seems, I don't know, it, it just seems like you can't do it, but we can build familiar paths to imaginative outcomes so that we get started on a path and then can branch out and solve other problems that way. Once you realize that you have it again, that you can use your imagination, it brings great joy. And imagination is the basis for sea change discovery, as I said with Einstein and, and figuring out relativity. It's the key to critical thinking. If you don't use it, you can make incremental discoveries or incremental tiny improvements and things. But to really come up with something that's amazing and awesome, you need your imagination. And imagination is liberating. And I truly believe that it is one of the great superpowers uh, that makes us human. So the principles of relearning imagination are that we need a growth mindset. That's really important on most things that we do, but we have to believe that we can improve. At any age, we can get better. We need to be kind to ourselves give ourselves permission to not be able to do this quickly. We haven't done it for a long time. It's like, you know, I, I used to ride horses. Now it's much more difficult to get up into the saddle. I watch calf ropers and, you know, I'm jealous, but anyway, so be kind to yourself. Close your eyes. Trust that using your imagination will be fun and that you can do it with other people too. It's not going to be a lonely exercise all the time. And allow your imagination to move through any dimension. So distance, time, size, space, maybe even other things. All right, so now let's begin the five exercises. The first exercise is about going for a walk. 
And this is just to get used to how we do this. And the subtext is that when you're using your imagination, your senses, your, what you feel in your fingers and your feet, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, um, the wind on your face, all those things become very important uh, as part of your brain, actually, for thinking about things when you're on, you know, going through an imaginative exercise. So in class, we'd start by imagining ourselves walking from the classroom to a nearby restaurant. So I suggest that you go through this exercise, think about it, and then stop, turn off the thing and turn, <laughs> turn off the video, and then think about something that you can do, like, you know, walk to the nearby school or walk to the grocery store or, you know, walk to a neighbor's house, but paying attention to every little thing that you see so that you will ex experience imagination when your whole body is involved in it. Okay. So to start, we close our eyes. And I think it's really important to close our eyes so that because this is an internal activity. And we're going to pick our destination. And if you're trying to do this in a group, it's fun. It's important to, you know, you will be able to do it in a group. It will take a lot of time because people don't like to speak up. But everyone needs to speak. Everyone needs to be part of it, okay? So you ask yourself, how do you start? Well, are you sitting down? Do you stand up? Do you turn around? Are you on a rug or on a hard floor? Which way do you go to the door? What does the door feel like? How do you know when you're outside? Or how do you know when you're in the next place? What do you feel on your feet? What do you feel in your face? What do you hear? What do you smell? And you go through this at every step of the exercise. How do you know you're in a new place, right? This is in your mind, your eyes are still closed. And when you are brought, have arrived, realize that you did not memorize that trip. You learned it with all of your senses. You learned it, as I say, in your bones. So this can be a routine warm-up exercise go going to different places. You can do it with new groups, but you can do it to kind of get the group to be cohesive in a way of understanding what it is we're doing. Once we get this exercise so that it becomes routine and kind of fun, then we can do things like get really small and go inside a cell, get really big and go to a star, um, go back in time, go forward in time, uh, all sorts of things that we can do individually or together. But I'm gonna stop now and let you go through the first exercise. Exercise two is what do you see? And that is to trust your path to bringing in new data, okay? And uh, trusting your inductive reasoning. Uh, what I noticed was that part of the difficulty in getting used to using your imagination or this, for this, my former students to using their imagination was that they didn't trust what they could see. I, and I think it was because they were, they again had so much input uh, and required to memorize that they didn't feel competent to look at something and kind of have a path to understanding what it was themselves. So the object of this exercise is to develop trust in your ability to understand new data. And this is a table, and you don't have to be a scientist for this. This is anybody should be able to do this exercise with this table. And it's a table from an older paper. And what I'd like you to do is just make a list of what you see. So you can stop the video again here and just make your list. Take your time and just write down what it is you see so that you can begin to understand your path to understanding and incorporating new information.
So I used this exercise to begin to understand how undergraduates interacted with data and help them learn to have agency over data. I would get really random responses often. They would just use, I would say, what do you see? And they would go, well, it's, it's about how nuclei work or it's about whatever. I mean, just random stuff because you couldn't tell from here exactly what it was about. And I remember especially one young man, and this was in a senior level class. And I would ask the class what they saw in this table and there was silence. And so I went over to him and I said, what is it you see? And he started shaking and crying. And he said, just tell me what you want me to see. And that was such a wake up call for me. So that young man actually went to medical school. And about five years after that class, I called him. <laughs> I said, this is, this is me. And I just want to know, did my class help you at all? And he said, well, genomics, of course, is the future of medicine. But he said, you're going to think this is really silly. But you know how we used to imagine ourselves getting small and going into a cell? He said, I did that to learn about antibiotic resistance, about the immune system, about blood vessels and all sorts of things. And he said, I was the best in my class at that. So I truly believe that, um, you know, kind of making these types of exercises part of some regular routine. And especially if you can do it in a group or with people that you like, that it's extremely helpful. Okay, so did you make a list? You pull your list out. Let's take a look. All right, so what do you see? Well, this might be on your list. There is a title. You don't have to tell me what it is. There are five columns. The first column is in numerical order. So that's probably just a sample or something. The next sets of columns say they're isolates and percent. I don't know what that means. However, let me take a look at that. There are more numbers in the last two columns than the first two columns. And there's ones towards the end of the column. There are bigger numbers in some than others. And there are many rows with, with ones, okay? So that's good. That's what I wanted you to see. Just the very basic things. Trust yourself to observe what's there. So to repeat this exercise and repetition of all of this is, is important. Do it regularly if you can. You can use a variety of materials, including maps, tables, kids' picture books, a hike in the woods, um, you know, even Where's Waldo? Uh, if the title of the material makes it too obvious, block that out. It's really about how you look at and process information. You have a right to be able to do this in a way that is natural to you, but you have to trust your ability to do it and not give that up to somebody, okay? The object is to help us all learn to trust ourselves, to find paths that allow us to be in charge of the information we're given. And, and by asking questions instead of being told, we build an active relationship with the information. So you can ask, well, what is this and what is that? But first of all, just say, what is it that you see? Exercise three, what am I reading? The subtext of this is that I'm the boss of what I read. <laughs> and again, uh, this is sort of based in my discovery with, with students in biology that we would read um, research papers and they would tend to go and then they did and then they did and then they did and then they did. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, you've got a brain. What do you what are we doing here? So we taught ourselves how to be uh, much more proactive about reading, uh, much more engaged, and, and have agency over what we were reading. So this was an approach, again, as I said, initially done to help undergraduate students with the scientific literature and, uh, and to get them past being overly passive because you don't, you just learn what somebody else wants to tell you you don't learn that you 
have the power to ask brilliant questions. Okay, and that's the important thing. We want every individual, you, you know, it's just important to know that in the right situation with the right um, uh, environment and support that I think anybody can ask really brilliant questions. I don't think brilliance is something that is just in a few people in the human race. I think there is brilliance in almost everybody I meet, okay? So this works well with technical papers, but you can probably do it in other writing. Um, I'm not sure you can do it in literature. So uh, if somebody's out there and you think about other, other types of writing that you might be able to use with this, let me know. So let's start. When you're looking at a paper, it's got a title. So you begin to say, well, what's the question? You know, what are they asking about what in this research in the paper? And then you stop and you go, well, if I were gonna ask this question, how would I address this problem, okay? And how did the people in the paper address the problem? And in scientific papers, we have a lot of figures. So you look at the figures and instead of going and just sucking it in, you go, well, what's the question? Are they asking it correctly? Does the data support? What would the data say to you? And then does the data support their conclusion? So exercise, exercise four is a bug list and bug lists are hugely important. In fact, um, this whole uh, area of research was something that developed when I had a bug list. I couldn't figure out why the students were having so much trouble. And I thought, you know, maybe it's our department. You know, <laughs> I was like ready to go after people. Um, and it, it turned out it wasn't. So it's, it's a good thing to have a bug list. You don't want to be a complainer and a whiner 24 seven, but writing down things that bug you can be very important, both for business opportunities and for making change and in yourselves and in our society. So we tend to stop at complaints, but the things that bug you have a role in building imagination. Working with your bug list can reveal your inner entrepreneur and it can help you solve some important community problem. So again, you can do this exercise alone or, or with a group. You can have a journal that has a bug list in it. That always works out well. And you start by what bugs you? What don't you, what, what really bug, are people speeding? Are they texting too much when they're driving? Do people in stores not look at you when you walk in? Um, are you having trouble communicating with somebody? Whatever. Something that you see that seems in the way or seems idiotic or tragic or just an unreasonable problem, make a list. Keep that list. Pick the one that bothers you the most. So remember there are often underlying forces that stabilize some behavior event or issue. So we're not, so you know how um, people along, when, back when I discovered this uh, creativity problem, this imagination problem, the answers for all the limits in our educational system were fire the teachers, the kids are lazy and the parents aren't doing their jobs. And when I first saw this thing in my students, you know, I, I just didn't think that was the answer to what I was seeing. And um, I, so I began to think about what I think are hard problems, things that involve human beings that are that have been around a long time. I call them actually chronic hard problems. Some people call them wicked problems. But what I found out was that uh, we tend to have knee-jerk responses to them. Like for instance, uh, the math scores aren't good, so um, make the students uh, memorize more. You know, and and that's not really the answer. I mean, the answer is that we're not using our imaginations enough to love math. But um, anyway, so so what you do is is just don't jump to conclusions about how to fix things, and don't just think people are stupid. So stop all that. Often there's evolutionary underpinnings and, and forces that stabilize something that's really difficult that you'd like to change. You should probably consider using big paper, whiteboards, different ways of diagramming, different ways of communicating, move around, 
uh, lots of different perspectives can help begin to um, loosen or deconvolute these kinds of, of difficult problems. So what are the parts that contribute to this problem? What stabilizes it? And ask yourself, what else do I need to know? I mean, this can be a long-term exercise where you begin to say, well, I would really love to fix homelessness or poverty or my church or the school, whatever, you know, it could be a long-term problem. And you have to begin to ask, what else do I need to know? And also begin to think about what stabilizes this problem. And that's like the evolutionary drives or as, and sometimes the aspects of human nature that might make this habitual or difficult to change. So humans like to form in groups, you know, sometimes that makes it difficult to change hiring mechanisms, for example. Um, so what solutions or disruptions can you imagine? And what would be the steps to doing this? Design an experiment, be the boss. It's, it's kind of fun to do this in a group if you can find the right people. Um, but it, you, this is also possible to do this by yourself. So things that bug you can be small issues, my schedule, making a sandwich or big things, polarization of our country, famine. The big bugs are typically in the realm of wicked or what I call chronic hard problems. And I'll talk about that in another video. But do not let that keep you from making your bug list, looking at it and asking, are there opportunities here if I can find a solution? And if they bug you, they're likely to bug other people too. And we have found numerous things that, that have been business opportunities or chances to pull community together or make change, whatever, based on, you know, I don't understand why this is, why we keep doing this this way. <laughs> so good luck with that. That's really important. So exercise five, the last exercise, right now, the way I know how to do it is based in biology but I'm certain that there are ways to do it in engineering and ways to do it in probably any discipline. Well, I know it's true. In history, you could go back in time. Um, and uh, anyway, this is, I, I just, you know, I had developed this uh, for my students uh, and it, it really helped them tremendously. There are other exercises you can do, other things that you can do, um, but, but, these five are extremely useful and they may lead to other things. For instance, um, whenever I go to a talk, I try to always think of questions because that gets me paying more attention. Plus it gets me engaged in the talk. And oftentimes these questions after the person has talked for a while are really um, very useful. Okay, so, so these can become just like you know, um, exercises in a gym. But uh, if you have ideas to help with this and give me other things I can add as uh, examples, that would be fantastic. So this is an exercise I started by having students imagine going into a cell. And uh, we also altered it. So I, but once I realized that it was their imaginations, using their imaginations, accessing and using their imaginations, that was a problem. Everything I taught, I would start with closing our eyes and becoming whatever it was we were going to talk about that day and getting into that world, whether it was uh, in a cell or, um, you know, it could be in history or literature or whatever you want to do um, so that you feel that you are in that environment. I would often say that it was easier for me to ask a question about the person next to me than it was to ask about my sister who was very far away. And the idea being that to ask brilliant questions, I think you need to get up extremely close to whatever you're asking a question about, whether it's a protein or a person or a society or something. I think we really undervalue the importance of 
being right next to it. That's, you know, again, Albert Einstein knew what he was talking about. I mean, he imagined himself riding on a particle of light. So he became very, 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 very tiny to be able to do that. Okay. If the DNA was going to be labeled, we'd be labeled cDNA and then centrifuged and go through a purification column and finally be added to a device or a membrane um, that had DNA that we could bind to. We'd float around in the membrane and I would talk about um, what you were looking for. We're looking to, to hybridize to our other strand of DNA. And we talk about how we could make that happen or not make it happen, make it, make it require a better match or a worse match. And when the students did this in the beginning of class, they had a better feel for their questions and asked much better questions because they were not distant from the technique but could feel it in their bones. This is not dissimilar from what you see uh, athletes at the Olympics. You know, if you're getting ready to go down a ski run or, or something, you know, they will imagine, you see them bobbing their heads and going through every little step. And that's what they're doing is imagining themselves going through that run so that they, they learn it in their bones. It's in their muscles. It's muscle memory to be able to do that. So I like imagining going into cells if you have any interest in biology because one, it requires us to be a different size. And two, we restore our imaginations and familiarity with basic cellular components and relative sizes. But again, I think there are many other ways to do this. I know there are. And most of all, because we begin to comprehend um, that the laws of physics at different scales, so that's from stars to humans to um, cells, apply to everything. Okay, from atoms to stars, so that we can use what we know at our level or things that we learn at the cellular level to imagine how cells or, or humans um, might, might adapt or do things that would allow them to succeed in whatever it is the, that they're supposed to be doing. I, I would get the students into, um, like in the inner membrane, inner membrane of the mitochondria, intermembrane space um, or going into the nucleus or that's really about as far as we'd get. Um, but you could, they begin to see that they weren't taught everything in class and that because they looked at it as something very small and different from us, that they couldn't even formulate questions that they can easily formulate when they're swimming around and they're tiny. So I talk about Gibbs free energy, but just ignore that for now. <laughs> it's really a cool concept. <laughs> so anyway, start, close your eyes and know that bacteria are one micrometer in length and yeast are five micrometers and more complex eukaryote cells are bigger, say 20 microns. Um, so I, I like to go into a yeast cell because that's what I studied. And so I'd say, well, what size should we be? And let them kind of like swim around in their heads. Like, what, how do I know what size we should be? But I loved it if, uh, we, if ten, we, 10 nanometers was good. And so I would say to the students, I'll get you past the cell wall. And I described the cell wall and um, all the proteoglycans, proteins with sugars on them and layers of sugar polymers and, and, and proteins and things. And then we'd get to the, to the lipid bilayer on the outside of the cell. And we would ask how thick that was. And uh, would I'd wait and wait and wait and wait. At first, these things are really slow. And, and people have a hard time guessing, again, because they don't feel confident in speaking what they're thinking, right? They just tell me what you want me to see. So I had to, that was the biggest thing to get people away from. And when the first time I did this, I asked someone, okay, now we're inside the cell. What is it you see? And there was dead silence for about 10 minutes. And one young woman said, I see walls. So I realized that they didn't have a mental picture of cells inside. And I would go, oh, watch out, watch out for that big 
that big uh, bunch of enzymes coming our way, they're all doing glycolysis. Oh my gosh, look at, you see those hamburger shaped proteins over there? They're, they're about two and a half times bigger than we are. They're 25 nanometers. Those are, those are ribosomes. And uh, oh my gosh, do you see these, the, the actin fibers and the microtubules and, the, and, and so I would get them excited realizing that if they were this small, if they were as small as we were imagining ourselves and inside the cell, that it would be a very active environment. And then we can swim around and they begin to repopulate their vision of what's inside a cell. And because they're about the same size, they can begin to see the kinds of challenges that proteins and organelles and various things have to deal with and how doggone complicated it is to, for just one cell to survive and grow, much less your entire body. So in conclusion, you can go from each exercise one by one. You don't have to do them all at once because it's pretty overwhelming and you probably need to take a nap. But I hope this has given you some ideas for relearning and growing your imagination. I fell into this by starting with a bug. My students didn't know how to access their imaginations. They actually got mad at me when I tried to make them do it. They didn't know if they were any good at it. They didn't know if it would be worth doing, they didn't understand that this was a superpower for them. And it has been a superpower for them. So be fearless in this pursuit, try to have fun. And most of all, ask questions. Imagination is a human superpower. Imagine where we'd be if Albert Einstein hadn't realized that imagination was more important than knowledge. Thank you.